And it's about time we've talked about Mars once again. And as always, when we talk about Mars, I usually start with rocks. But this time, this Martian rock is actually right here on Earth. And that's because recently this went viral. This rock was sold for over $5 million at an auction and basically became the most expensive meteorite ever sold anywhere. And so following the sale, it made me reconsider my career choices. I might have to move to like Tunisia or Morocco and start looking for rocks as well. But I guess before I do that, let's finish this video and discuss some of the major discoveries from the last few months. And here is actually one from the Perseverance rover. Another bizarre unexplained rock that seems to contain tiny spherules and seems to be much darker than other rocks in the same region. Which means that this rock probably came from somewhere else and could actually be an actual meteorite on Mars or possibly an igneous rock produced by some kind of a volcanic activity a long time ago. And I bet that rock would be just as expensive. But obviously we have a lot of other discoveries as well. Discoveries and findings from various missions that do paint a much clearer picture of Mars's past and even its distant future. And while well, over the years, especially based on some of the recent research, our understanding of this red planet has actually changed quite dramatically. And what we're learning so far isn't just about rocks and dust, it is about fundamental processes that shape the destiny of this red planet, but that also help us understand if life can exist anywhere else except for planet Earth. But as we know on Earth, life needs water. And so let's actually start with some of the water-related discoveries, because when it comes to Mars, this is still a bit of an ongoing question. And for many years, it was always accepted that billions of years ago, Mars was potentially much wetter and much warmer, with various evidence suggesting that it hosted extensive bodies of liquid water, which was potentially supported by a much thicker atmospheric layer, very rich in carbon dioxide. And this is of course based on a lot of observations from the surface and studies from various orbiters around Mars. And so in one of the recent papers, scientists utilized computer simulations to discover that a lot of different valleys on Mars, like the ones for example in the Jezero crater, that's of course the crater where Perseverance is currently exploring, contain signs of hundreds of ancient lakes that were very likely shaped by heavy precipitation, most likely the result of rain or snow. But naturally this was a long time ago. 4.1 to 3.7 billion years ago. And the patterns observed on Mars seem to align with models of distributed precipitation and not scenarios involving melting ice caps. Essentially confirming that rain and snow was very likely quite regular on Mars, at least in the first billion years. But the question of water on Mars today is a lot more nuanced. Especially because there's been a lot of observations that was kind of difficult to explain and researchers thought that maybe there is still water somewhere on the surface. At least as some kind of a really salty brine water that could potentially reshape the surface. And one of the biggest examples coming from the surface was mostly observed by various orbiters. It kind of resembles something like this or even something like this. These really large dark streaks they were actually discovered in so many different locations across Mars. Officially these are known as RSL or recurring slope lineae and they seem to appear seasonally, which to scientists suggested that well maybe this is some kind of a water deposit seeping through the surface and producing these dark streaks. In this case this would be extremely salty briny water because that's the only way for it not to evaporate and to exist on Mars. And naturally this discovery created a lot of excitement, hinting at potential present-day hydrological activity and maybe even some kind of a huge reservoir of liquid water somewhere right under the surface. This could obviously be used to support a colony or more importantly could even support alien life. But these conclusions might have been just a little bit premature because a new comprehensive study that analyzed 500,000 such streaks almost definitely debunked this hypothesis, because these seem to be produced by dry effects and not liquids. Here all of these streaks seem to be located slightly closer to various impacts and also usually experienced above average surface wind velocities and dust deposition rates. Yet there was no relation between these streaks and various types of CO2 deposits or anything that could produce liquid water. And more importantly, they definitely concluded that there seemed to be no actual seasonal effects like previously stated, with all of these streaks produced through some kind of a natural means, most likely as a result of Martian dust. But exactly how this is done is still not entirely clear. 
And so if there's no surface water here, where exactly did all of the ancient Martian water disappear to? Well, quite a lot of it very likely became different types of minerals, or became trapped inside minerals and is now somewhere underneath. Some of it was also frozen in the polar ice caps, but there's actually apparently another unusual source. Recent seismic data from the NASA's Inside Lander provides definitive hints of vast underground reservoirs of liquid water somewhere around 5 to 8 kilometers underneath. This was detected by listening to seismic waves from meteorite impacts and by identifying low velocity layers approximately 5 to 8 kilometers below the surface. This layer seems to represent highly porous rock filled with liquid water and resembling a kind of a sponge. Which by itself is of course a really exciting discovery. And a discovery that's not so different from what seems to happen on our own planet as well. Planet Earth has a lot of water hidden underneath as well, and potentially enough to fill several oceans on the surface, but still basically trapped inside the planet. And so this hidden body of water could account for a significant portion of Mars's missing water, very likely enough to cover the entire planet, with an ocean up to about 700 meters deep. And this water seems to be in many different locations, but unfortunately is a little bit too deep to actually reach or to use for various colonies. And trying to reach this is just part of the problem. Another problem is the fact that a lot of stuff on Mars is technically toxic to humans. For example, a lot of Martian regolith and a lot of the briny water is permeated with toxic perchlorates, making this water basically unusable. But a relatively recent project known as Project Tethys a project that was funded by NASA, developed a really intriguing method of purifying Martian frozen liquid water, specifically focusing on the removal of these hazardous perchlorates. This is a pretty intriguing project and you can learn about this in one of the studies in the description, and essentially represents a somewhat important project for a potential future crewed mission to planet Mars. Ok, we've discussed water, well, let's talk about the atmosphere. Especially atmosphere that would be rich in carbon dioxide, which we believe would have acted as greenhouse gas to keep this planet much warmer before. But here we have this other question. Where exactly did all of the carbonates go? For example, here on Earth, all of the carbon dioxide usually gets sequestered inside rocks and becomes carbonate minerals. For example, limestone. This is a relatively slow process, but it's absolutely crucial for regulating the planet's climate over time. And previous Martian models also predicted something similar on Mars, suggesting that these carbonate minerals should be everywhere, just like on planet Earth. Yet orbital surveys and early rover investigations did not actually find almost any. And this was of course a missing piece of evidence when it comes to the history of Martian climate and the fate of its somewhat unique and somewhat bizarre atmosphere. But then we had a bit of a breakthrough. This was from the NASA's Curiosity rover. After 13 years of exploring the Gale Crater, it finally made its first discovery of what's known as Siderite, a mineral that resembles something like this. And this is an iron carbonate mineral whose discovery on Mars serves as a possible indicator of a presence of huge amounts of water and, of course, carbon dioxide. But the discovery was a little bit strange because here it was found several centimeters below the surface and also inside the rock. It was also masked by highly water-soluble magnesium sulfate salts, which potentially explained why we couldn't actually see these minerals before. These salts seem to obscure carbonate signatures from various orbital observations, potentially explaining why no carbonates have been discovered for so many years. But the presence of siderite definitively confirms active carbon cycle that was very likely operating on Mars for billions of years. And so here we had carbon dioxide abundant atmosphere and of course water that created these minerals. But here there was one major difference between this and planet Earth. There was a bit of an imbalance. On Earth, volcanic activity continuously releases carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere, essentially creating a kind of a self-regulating, stable environment. Mars, on the other hand, did not have a lot of volcanism, despite having the largest volcanoes in the solar system. Here's actually the picture showing us how big they were, with one of them recently captured in this beautiful image. And so because of the lack of constant volcanism, over time more and more CO2 was turned into rocks, with less and less released into the atmosphere. And this imbalance meant that eventually Mars would become colder and colder and the water would eventually disappear. 
which produced only brief periods when liquid water could exist, followed by hundreds of millions of years of dry desert conditions. In contrast, on planet Earth, the long-term habitability is only possible because of the balance achieved between geology and constant sequestering of CO2. But naturally there were some other effects too. This was recently discovered by the NASA's MAVEN spacecraft. And that's because here this NASA spacecraft recently observed what's known as sputtering. A bizarre effect that potentially stripped the rest of the atmosphere, leaving Mars almost completely barren. And the way this works is relatively simple. It involves high energy particles from solar wind colliding with the Mars' upper atmosphere and then fleeing neutral atoms into space. So here's roughly what this would look like if we were to observe one single atom. And this was of course predicted for many years, but it has finally been observed by the MAVEN orbiter. With the direct observation here, confirming this mechanism by observing atoms of argon, and revealing that the sputtering seems to occur at a rate of four times higher than previously predicted, and being especially intense during solar storms. And so without having some kind of a global magnetic field to protect Mars, here the atmosphere would be very vulnerable and would disappear after just a few hundred million years. And sort of related to this, we now have our first image of the first ever visible aurora from the surface of Mars. And here's roughly what this image looks like. It's not really that impressive, but here this image from the Perseverance captured in March of 2024, shows us this very, very faint green light from excited oxygen molecules during the solar storm, which is actually exactly what we observe on Earth as well, but obviously usually much more intense. And this is of course important for science because it gives us a new way to study Martian atmosphere by literally seeing the atoms as they interact with the particles from the sun. Okay, enough about atmosphere. What about possibility of life? Well, even after years of research, most of this is still pretty much speculative. But there is one research coming from Earth that is kind of exciting. This was based on various extremophiles and even larger animals such as brine shrimp. Here's one of these creatures, and we usually find these in various deserts. And so could something like this maybe survive here? Well, Artemia franciscana, or the brine shrimp, has indeed showed us that it's quite adaptable to Mars-like pressure conditions, suggesting that, in some sense, it might be able to survive on Mars, or at least, similar resilient life forms could exist there right now. And at the same time, lichens, or symbiotic associations of fungi and bacteria, can easily withstand intense Martian ionizing radiation and even extreme temperatures, while also remaining metabolically active even under simulated Martian conditions. In other words, lichen and maybe even brine shrimp could possibly survive on modern Mars. But it's a pretty big maybe, because in order to continuously survive on Mars, they would still need liquid water, which they do require at all times. But right now we seem to have at least four different types of creatures that can potentially live on Mars. We now have lichens, brine shrimp, naturally tardigrades, and even certain types of mosses. And that means that all four could technically be future candidates for Martian missions and presently can be used to model extraterrestrial life. But this doesn't answer the question of whether there is life on Mars right now. And well, the thing is, there might be but it's not from Mars originally. And that's because one of the recent studies discovered that some of the extremophile bacteria were accidentally discovered before the NASA's Phoenix lander launch approximately 18 years ago. And these microbes do possess genes allowing them to survive vacuum of space and even some of the most extreme environments like the ones found on Mars. And so for all we know, some of them could have actually made it to Mars on these landers and might have even established themselves in some of the deposits nearby. But as before, at least for now, this is just a speculation. And so based on a lot of these discoveries, it paints Mars as even more diverse and more unusual compared to what we previously thought. A world of precipitation, rivers, lakes, active carbon cycle, and the possibility of ancient life, but a world that possibly lacked certain geological activity such as volcanoes to survive long term. And though the search for life, either ancient life or present life, is still the main driver for most of this research, since there is now a possibility of having actual crewed missions to Mars, some of these new studies are also exploring the idea behind human habitability, with the focus on various extremophiles, to essentially learn from them on how humans can survive too. 
And so here, for many years now, I think Mars is going to remain an extremely important planet for science, and possibly even become some kind of a natural laboratory, in order to help us understand planetary evolution, possibility of alien life, and of course our own place in the vastness of the universe. But I'm sure in the next few months we're going to have so many more discoveries, and possibly some discoveries that are even more bizarre than the ones discussed today. And so until then, thank you for watching, check out some of the previous discoveries from Mars in some of the videos in the description, maybe support this channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM me directly, or by joining the channel membership which grants you early access and a few more extra videos, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt that actually does feature Mars in one of the designs. On that note, thank you for watching, stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.